How's everybody doing? Looks like we survived the eclipse, huh? I don't know, by the news, I didn't think I'd survive for some reason. So guys, we're going to jump right into our text. We're in Ephesians 5, and we're starting in verse 8 to 21, and there's a lot to cover here. And for some reason, it's not popping up there. I don't know if you guys need to switch something over. Oh, there's a button. Button, button. Who's got the button? Testing. <laughs> you put on the first light bulb? There you go. That's really so it doesn't work, but we're going to read anyway. Well, I, I need to read from this. <laughs> All right. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of spirit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God." So this is an interesting word, and there's a lot here in this word. Um, the first thing that we can notice when we look at this is that first sentence, for you were once darkness. Guys, this is an identity statement. This is who we were. At our deepest core, we were darkness. So the question is, what is darkness? What is it? Does anybody know? The absence of light is what we hear a lot of. These are some common answers that you get, right, when you ask the question, what is darkness? It's evil, it's separation from God, it's wickedness, immorality, deceitfulness, ignorance, and the absence of light. Very common. But when we look into the scripture and what the scripture has to say, it gives us a little bit of a description about what this darkness is. It calls it, calls it all different kinds of things. First, there's a physical darkness. That's like if I turn the lights out and I can't see anymore, right? Right? Then there's a spiritual darkness, which has to do with an immorality. There's an outer darkness, and this is a place of weeping or gnashing of teeth. It's a place of judgment. Then you have a land or a kingdom of darkness. And in that kingdom, there are deeds of darkness. So these are things that we do physically, or we say, or we speak. And then there's this place called deep darkness. And that's a place where if you're fully given over to your sin, God puts you into a depraved mindset to where you're just deep in this darkness and it's really hard to get out of it. And then you have this shadow of death, which we read of in Job in Psalms 23. And then it talks about this power of darkness and it tells us that we were at one time under that power of darkness. So it's something that ruled over us. But if we really want to, to dig into darkness and what it means on a deep level, we can look into the Hebrew. Guys, the Hebrew is fascinating. It, it's made up of letters that are like pictographs. It's similar to Chinese, okay? In the Chinese language, every letter is a picture, and it's the same thing in the Hebrew. And the letters that make up darkness in Hebrew, and it's read right to left, is the aleph, the shin, and the kaf, or the chet, excuse me, the shin and the kaf. And the chet, it actually is a picture of a sanctuary or an inner room, an area private and separate, secure, cut off, and a place separate and private could be a prison cell. 
And the shin, you can see it's kind of a picture of teeth. It actually means teeth or to be crushed, pressed down and destroyed. And the kaf, it actually represents a palm of a hand and it has a twin meaning. It's a hand that covers or uncovers to open or allow or close and forbid entrance, closing a door so no one can enter or escape. So you see a picture of darkness forming there. It's a place. It has dimensions. It, it's a place that crushes or presses down. It destroys. And, and there's a forbidden entrance or exit in this place of darkness. Does that sound like a place you want to go? Not me. Okay. And we know that darkness has a prince and a king and a ruler. And his name is Lucifer. In Isaiah it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who are weakened, who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest parts of the pit. So I want you to notice something. A trend of Lucifer is I will, I will, I will, I will, and I will. It's all about him and his will. And this is the prince of darkness. And if you use a metaphor of a tree, you know, darkness, it has fruits. And these are all fruits of darkness. You've got uncleanness and disrespect and strife, seditions, fornication, adultery, pride, envy, gluttony, sloth, idolatry, lust, murder, drunkenness, hatred, coveting, lying, deceit, stealing, division, wrath, witchcraft, revelings. These are all fruits of darkness. And darkness also has a trunk, and you could call that trunk sin, but it also has a root. And the root is the thing that needs to get plucked up. And the root is self. It's the I will. I will, I will, I will, I will. Okay? And darkness has a kingdom. And the kingdom is made up of a bunch of these trees of self. Okay? So when you are in darkness, and the scripture that Paul brought says we were darkness, so this is what we were, we basically become a mini-god. We are our own God. We decide for ourselves what is good and evil. We don't rely on God to do that. We do that ourselves. And because there's about a million or a billion different versions of what is good and evil, there's conflict, okay? There's death. There's war, violence, confusion, chaos, destruction, and most of all, disorder. This is darkness. We look to Jude he was talking about the old and the new apostates. So these are people that were within the body, but they weren't really of the body. Listen to what he says. He says, These are spots on your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars from whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So notice, they serve only themselves. Guys, there's people within the body, even here, that maybe only serve themselves. And what's reserved for them is the blackness of darkness forever. Think about that. And Job, he talks about darkness. He says, are not my days few? Cease, leave me alone, that I might take a little comfort before I go to the place from which I shall not return, to the land of darkness and the shadow of death, a land as dark as darkness itself, as the shadow of death without any order, for even the light is like darkness. So he equates darkness to a place that has no order. Okay, remember that. So we were darkness and then it says in Ephesians 5 therefore he Jesus says awake you who sleep arise from the dead and Christ will give you light so we learn from this text that we were darkness but we are light so the next question is what is light Does anybody know what light is 
Kind of a deep question, isn't it? It's a big question. Guys, light is a mystery. So scientists have been studying physical light for a long time, and they still can't figure it out. Einstein was studying light. He couldn't figure it out. He had some theories about light. But today they're studying light still, and they're seeing that physical light, actually the waves of light react differently in different situations as if it has a mind of its own. So scientists today can't even figure out physical light, much less spiritual light. But if we want to learn about light, we go to the beginning, right? And maybe close your eyes for a second. Let's, let's read from Genesis 1, the first four days. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So God made a firmament and divided the waters that were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the water called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed after its kind, And the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning was the third day. Then God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And so God made great lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So guys, when we read that, there's more questions than answers, isn't there? The questions that come up, first, was darkness already there? Was it created by God? This is something me and Pastor Matt discussed a couple years ago and tried to figure it out. We disagreed a little bit, but really neither of us could figure it out or prove it. Um, It's a question that we can't really answer. Why is light created when there's nothing yet to look at on the first day is another question. On the first day, God creates heaven, but then he creates heaven on the second day too. What does that mean? God creates plants on the third day, and then he creates the sun on the fourth day. And we know that plants need the sun to survive, to thrive. So what sustained the plants on the third day? Right. And what's the difference between the light of the sun on the fourth day and the light created on the first day? These are all questions that come up about light. It's very mysterious, okay? If we look at the Hebrew word for light, it's or. In English, O-W-R, or. And it's made up of three Hebrew letters, the Aleph, the Vav, and the Resh. And the Aleph, the pictograph, represents a bull's head. And the Vav represents a nail or a tent peg. And the Resh represents a head. And this is actually a child root word. It has a parent root word, and the parent root word is or. And it's made up of just the two letters, the first and the last, the Aleph and the Resh. And the Aleph means leading or put in front or led by. And the Resh means the top, the summit, or the head. So that parent root word, or, it means strength from above, being led from the top. It describes an accumulation in one place that results in an emptiness or barrenness everywhere else. A city to put in order or to organize. And when you add the Vav 
the tent peg, and isn't it ironic that it's like a nail on the middle of this thing in the child root word, that's actually an added word that serves as an intensifier to the root word or. It's an act of organizing into a box to overall organization, order, or light. So this Hebrew term light is referring to order and organization. And we see that order and organization happening over and over again in the creation story. We see that he separates darkness from light. He separates water from above from the water below. The land is separated from the water. He procreates all of these animals and plants according to their kind in their boxes in a very organized and orderly way. So this is basically creating order out of a chaotic situation. This is what that light was. This is the mechanism for transferring the order that exists within the Father onto his creation, and it's led from above. This is light. It has to do with order. And light also has a metaphor of a tree, and a tree has fruits, and those fruits are called the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and that tree has a root, and that root is the Holy Spirit and fire. This is what we're baptized with. And that kingdom, the kingdom of light, is led by the king, one king, not a bunch of many kings and many gods, just one, and that's Jesus. And in his kingdom of light, there are fathers, there's pastors, there's leaders, there's elders, okay? And those fathers, pastors, leaders, and elders, they've got families and fellowships and organizations and the body, and they rule these things in order according to the wishes of the king. This is the kingdom of light. So we were once darkness, but now we are light. Are we bringing order into our families? Are we bringing order into our, our bodies, into the body? Are we bringing order into our businesses, the order of Christ? Because this is light, and we are light. And we learn that Jesus is light. He says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So we know that he was the light of the world while he was in the world. But what about when he's out of the world? He's in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father. When we go to the Sermon on the Mount, this is a sermon where he's not just speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to the multitudes, everybody that gathered at that mountain. And here's what he said. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown down, out, and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven." So this gives us a few things to chew on. First, he calls us a city on a hill. Well, what does that mean, a city on a hill? Guys, what it means is that from the moment that you declare Jesus Christ as your Lord publicly, you are then set on a hill, whether you like it or not. You are out in the open for everybody to see you, okay? And you will be analyzed, you're going to be judged, you're going to be scrutinized whether you like it or not. So people are going to look into your life, and they're going to want to judge, is this person's faith genuine? Is he really doing and saying what he says he believes? They're going to look into your home life, and they're going to say, how is he dealing with his house? How is he dealing with his wife? How is he dealing with his children? How is he dealing with his business? What does that look like in his business? How does he deal with everyday situations? Okay? They're going to scrutinize every last point in your life. And you know why? Because they are molding their opinion of Jesus by what they see you do and by what they see you say. No pressure. Okay? And we don't have a choice. When we declare Jesus is Lord, we are put on the hill. No choice. So we are a city on a hill. Secondly, he tells us that we are a lamp. And we, we are put on a lampstand. We're not hidden, okay? And I believe he's referring to the holy place. And this is a picture of what the holy place looks like. Guys, when the priest would walk into the holy place, there's three articles in there. 
To the left, you have the golden lampstand. To the right, you have this uh, table of showbread. And right in front of you, you had the altar of incense. And on that table of showbread to the right, there were 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And what the priests would do is they'd come into that holy place and they would eat of that bread of the table of showbread and it was known as them communing with God or sitting in the presence of God and having a meal. And this is where the whole concept of holy communion comes from, communion with our Lord, where we take the bread and the wine. It comes from this in the temple in the Old Testament, okay? But that bread, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So that bread represents Jesus. And then to the left, you have this lampstand. It has seven lamps on it. And we th see throughout Scripture that that lampstand represents the church. Remember in Revelation, the seven letters to the churches, the seven churches? And we hear about the golden lampstand and the two olive trees that stand before God day and night. This is the church. And on these lampstands, there's these lamps. And those lamps aren't like candles of today. The lamps, there's a picture of one up to the top right. That's an actual ancient lamp. But basically, it had a little basin for oil and a wick hanging out of it for light. Okay? This is representative of something. Remember John the Baptist when he came? And he said, I didn't come to bat or I came to baptize you with, with water. But the one after me comes to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So this is what this represents. We give our life to Jesus. We declare he's our Lord. We get baptized. He baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and fire. And now we are a lamp and we are on fire. And our only purpose is to shine light on Jesus. In that chamber, that was the purpose of the lampstand, to shine light on Jesus. So that means whether it's in your life, in your faith, with your family, with your business, in your church, with your non-believing family, your whole purpose in life is to shine light on Jesus in everything that you do. Pretty interesting, huh? And then, he says, you are the salt of the earth. This is real interesting. I don't know if you remember Abraham. He was pleading for Sodom. And he went to God, and he said, God, if there's 50 righteous people in this city, will you spare it? God says, sure, I'll spare it. He said, what about 45? God says, sure. What about 40? Okay, sure. What about 30? Sure. What about 20? Okay. What about 10? And he's thinking in his mind, well, Lot has a wife, and he's got daughters, and they have husbands. There's got to at least be 10, okay? And what we know is that there wasn't even 10 righteous people in that city because God ends up destroying it. But what this story tells us is that just a few pieces of salt, a few grains of salt can preserve a whole people. And we are supposed to be the salt to the earth. And this world is dark. Are we going out and preserving those that are around us? Are we keeping our saltiness? Okay, when I first came to faith, it was interesting, God moved me to probably the worst neighborhood in Denver. <laughs> And I was surrounded by stuff I never thought I'd be surrounded by. I even had somebody visit me at 3 o'clock in the morning who was demon-possessed on my front doorstep. And that's a story I'll tell you sometime. <laughs> but it was crazy, okay? But when I was in that circumstance, in that situation, God was showing me something, that I'm the light. And it doesn't matter where I am. I bring that light, and it's a preservative. I'm the salt, Okay? And I saw things happen. I saw people come to Jesus, even in the darkest places of Denver where I was at the time. Guys, if we aren't the salt, if we aren't preserving ourselves as salt, guess what the scripture says? It says we're good for nothing. Good for nothing. So are we the salt? So Paul tells us, because we're the light, because we're the salt, because we're the city on the hill. He tells us, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, 
but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So he gives us four things there. First, walk wise, understand the Lord's will, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and submit to one another. Guys, wisdom, what is wisdom? What's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord, right? And godly wisdom doesn't make any sense to us, does it? I could see myself sitting in the room with Joshua before he went to Jericho, and he says, Here, guys, here's the plan. We're just going to walk around the city for six days. <laughs> Seventh day, we're going to walk around the city seven, six times, seven times. We're going to blow some trumpets and make a bunch of noise. Let's go. I mean, that doesn't make sense to a man, to a human. It sounds crazy, okay? But God's wisdom and power are beyond our understanding. We saw that with Naaman. He has leprosy. He's told to go and bathe in a river, a dirty river, seven times. He's probably thinking, I'm going to catch another disease from that river, right? To a man, it doesn't make any sense. Jesus goes and heals a blind man with a bunch of mud. Holy Spirit said, Jesus, hey, spit in your hand, put some dirt in there, and put it in this guy's eyes. Think about that for a second. The man is blind. You're going to put mud in his eyes, <laughs> and you're going to heal him? It doesn't make any sense, okay? The wisdom of God doesn't make sense. But guys, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and that's when we see his power move. And because we are light, we walk in wisdom. Understand the will of God. This begins with three things. First, when we make decisions, we commit our decisions to God before we even decide to make a decision, okay? We say, God, this is your decision to make. Second, we read God's word, we pray, and we fast. And third, we seek godly advice from other mature believers. And all while we're doing that, we consult with the Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, what do I do here? And then you wait on the rima. You wait to hear from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and then you act according to the Holy Spirit, and you trust God for the result. This is seeking and understanding the will of God. It requires a discipline of us getting with God, talking to God, listening to God, okay? And because we are light, we do this. And he says, be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and praise and cry, psalms and hymns and, and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your hearts and giving thanks, Guys, he mentions this again in the book of Colossians, this, this term of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. A psalm, this is inspired by God. And there's a book of psalms. And that book of psalms, it's full of a lot of crying out, a lot of misery, a lot of just being truthful about where you're at in life. You're sad. You don't understand God's plan, followed by praise. That's what a psalm is. And when we are light, and because we are light, we sing in those psalms, meaning we sing in truth to God and to one another. We don't live in a lie. We don't live like everything's rosy all the time. We're truthful, okay? We're in truth with each other. Hymns, this is, these are songs that we make that are surrounding doctrine and truths and things of that nature, and we sing these songs in church and worship. Spiritual songs. So you have natural songs, which you can hear, Okay, something that's spiritual, you can't hear it touch, it, touch it, taste it, smell it, see it. This is a song that comes from your heart. It's a melody that comes out of the joy that God placed in your heart. And this is something that comes with being the light. And then singing and making melody in your heart and giving thanks. Okay, this is, this is a part of walking in the light. This is just what comes out of us. And lastly, Paul tells us, to submit to one another. In 1 John 2, 8 to 11, it says, Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is the light in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So let me ask you something. 
can anybody in this room submit to somebody that you hate truly? It's really hard to try and submit to somebody that you hate. Guys, if we are in light, we are in love. And that means we can submit to anybody, everybody. Jesus submitted to everybody until death and up until death. He submitted. Why? Because he loved them. And that's supposed to be our role too. Guys, we live in a dark world. This is a world that's in need of love and light. And it's not a time to retreat. Okay? Christians, we have the, the habit of clumping up into groups of Christians and saying, I'm going to go live in my little world with all the little Christians over here. But you know what happens when you get a clump of salt on food, a big clump? How does the food taste? Bitter. It's not what it's supposed to taste like, okay? It's important to build each other up, but then we go out into this world that is in need of light and salt, and we do what Paul says, and we get filled with the Spirit, and we go and we bring his word and his light to the world. All right, let's pray. Father, we just say thank you for this time. We thank you for all of these men that are here. Lord, we pray that you can bless our time and our groups. Um, help us in our discussions. Help us to speak truth to one another. Help us to grow together. Most importantly, Lord, help us to be light for our families, for those that are not believers in our families, uh, for those that we meet at work and those that we meet just out in the world. Lord, help us to preserve our city, and to preserve our nation by the way that we carry ourselves in this place. Help there to be hundreds of righteous men in this place that can be a preservative for you, Lord. We just thank you for what you continue to do in this body. We pray over our leaders. We pray over Pastor Matt. We pray over Pastor Dave and all they continue to do to serve us. And we just thank you for each other in Jesus' name. We pray.